The Book of Recollections, Episode 21, From the Ashes, by Dysylvania. Ready or not, here I am to recount the shenanigans our heroes got into by listening to Castiel. Was it worth it? Only time and story will tell. I am the Book of Recollections, yada yada, you know me. Let's get into the Citadel of Death. Our brave heroes, having gained fresh skin by means no gods would ever endorse, awoke naked in a pile of corpses. They were in a large room, filled to the brim with the remains of strange, stout and ashen-skinned people that none of them had ever encountered before. They started rummaging through the belongings of those peculiar beings and soon realized that the walls were filled to the brim with writings that were beckoning. From the depths of that place, old scratching noises reverberated throughout the chamber as if someone was etching using a quill into hard stone. In spite of our hero's rather naked status, they felt as if their magical items had not left them, having the power to call them forth in the manifestation of their faith, even in that otherwise unholy place. After clothing themselves in the garbs of the dead, they slowly navigated through the maze-like structure only to encounter more and more bizarre apparitions. The first peril was a certain something blocking the only tunnel offering a way forward through the nightmarish citadel. Jen and Grace tried going through, only to almost choke out on their way into their every cavity, impending their breathing. The only one that was successful at first was Jen, but the room she discovered bore no hope of salvation as it contained a similar amount of corpses strewn throughout the room, with many of them huddled around strange, cracked mirrors which she foolishly attempted to investigate on her own. While she was busy disregarding every notion of safety, her companions kept trying to figure out what was blocking their path. When Grace came back defeated and Jen sent a shivering shout down the corridor, then, and only then, they seemed to realize that a gigantic gelatinous cube was blocking their path. Then, with the help of Shaq's otherworldly resistance and Adam's carefully curated magical powers, they managed to endure through the blockage, albeit one by one, and reach Jen. Unfortunately, when they got to her, they couldn't tell what was wrong with her. Jen was standing at 90 degrees angle on the walls, staring into one of the mirrors, screaming, crying, and bleeding from every orifice. Eventually, her companions nudged her out of her torpor, but the grotesque figure Jen saw reaching out from the mirror and grabbing her would linger long in her mind. With the party reunited, they continued their descent into the depths of the citadel. The next room resembled an auditorium filled with shades all gurgling together a cacophony of sounds. In the center of the stage, an ever-shifting silhouette with a tower above all of them, directing the maddened symphony to an ever greater crescendo. The gang soon realized that stepping into the room without precaution might very well mean the death of all of them, so they stood and pondered their options. Together with Leo matching the mad tune on his newly found hurdy-gurdy just enough so that his own sounds would add to the disjointed cacophony, with Grey stepping into the power ingrained into the very etchings that plastered every millimeter of the citadel's walls, and the rest of the party doing their best not to disturb their carefully laid out plans, they managed to shroud themselves into a veil of sound and were finally free to move about the strange room without any harm coming their way. Just before they exited the room, 
Jen spotted a small passage, so she ventured to check what secrets lay buried there. <sighs> of course she did, some people never learn. She found a strange creature with ashen skin, just like the many corpses that they had encountered up until then. Unfortunately, the man made no sense being afraid to death of her, and whichever companion entered the room, addressing them by unfamiliar names and crying to be spared. Alarmed by the crying, the heroes tried to shut him up, but as soon as he sensed their aggression, he attempted to flee. Regrettably for him, whilst he managed to dodge the more compassionate members of the party, he was stopped by Shaq, who promptly proceeded to shut him up forever by eating him. That would have spun an intense conversation about morality, but luckily, Leo stopped them right in their tracks as he couldn't maintain his tune much longer. So they had to keep moving. As they continued advancing into the depths, a strange feeling came over them, as if they were both being observed and followed by something particularly big. They next reached a corridor that seemed to have been barricaded. Large metal defensive walls were stern throughout the length of the corridor and, at the far end, a large metal gate. Before venturing forth, Adam was lucky enough to spot a small opening in the stone wall and decided to send his familiar. He found an even larger passageway that ran parallel to the one they were in. Where the large metal door would have been, there was a pool filled to the brim with dark cloudy water, and from the other end of the aisle, they could hear disgusting sounds. A series of squelching, burping, and something heavy dragging its body. They decided it would be best to continue down the fortified path, with Pax, Adam, Grace and Leo going straight ahead, and Jen and Shaq opting for a similar strategy, albeit via the use of the ceiling. Regrettably for them, the corridor had been booby-trapped and they had almost lost their lives trying to get to the far end of it. Once reaching the heavy metal doors, they were greeted by a circular room that had a dark cloudy pool with a stone platform in the center of it, where the remains of a former camp could be found. The sight was gruesome, with the piles of viscera being plastered throughout the surface of the platform. Thanks to Grace's use of magic, they managed to detect that someone was still alive. Inside one of the few remaining tents, they found a bottle, realizing that the contents of the bottle were, in fact, one of the strange creatures that they had encountered. It seemed that they had been forced into the container and were being kept alive through foul magic. Grace tried to get the creature to cling on, promising that she would help him, but he protested vehemently, accusing her of great cruelty. Before she had a chance to retort, the room shook, and from below the surface of the water, deformed tendrils started to arise. Despite their exhaustion, they managed to fight off the creatures and learned a thing or two. The tendrils were only fragments of a much larger being, most likely the one they had heard crawling through the passageways. The pools had been filled with Sabbath water, rendering them deadly to the touch. The flesh of the tendrils seemed to be unbothered by the effects of the Sabbath waters. Seeing how the fleshy lumps that had broken from the main body were still trying to get back to it, Jen engulfed herself in its flesh to be protected from the Sabbath water's effect and threw herself in the waters, hoping that the main body would take back its missing piece. To give her a helping hand, Pax entered the tapestry hoping to all gods she would pull him out before his breath ran out. It seemed that their gods had indeed smiled upon them that day, for the behemoth, that huge tentacled creature, accepted its missing piece, and Jen, 
even though she was crushed by the ever-changing viscera that surrounded her, managed to resist both her instinct to vomit and the crushing of her bones, successfully retrieving another piece of her grandmother's heart. Without that piece of heart that was animating it, the behemoth quickly collapsed into a mass of flesh. Before getting a well-earned rest, Grace freed the poor creature trapped in the bottle, earning their thanks for granting them death, and in exchange provided some information about what their expedition was seeking there. It seemed that they came from the underground city of Boulder, and they were looking for the tools of a great artificer of their people, called the Duragar, for both honor and the betterment of their city. After the party rested, they were ready to face the new challenge that laid before them in the next room, a dark lake filled with tendrils that sought to drag them to the bottom was set between them and the next part of their journey. In order to cross it, they were forced to sacrifice a part of themselves, which Grace accepted with arguably little protest. Upon doing so, a glass boat emerged from the dark deep, and after a bit of investigating, they realized they needed light in order for it to move. They did try a few hijinks beforehand, with Adam making one of them fly, but they soon stopped when the tendrils from the lake started spreading, threatening to engulf the whole room. And so, they boarded the boat, and with a rather smart plan, they enveloped themselves into a cone of darkness so as not to disturb the dark tendrils. With Leo conjuring lights in front of them to guide the vessel, they safely reached the other side. Upon getting to the next room, they met the strangest character yet, a man dressed in dark robes, bearing a mask of iron that allowed his interlocutors to bear witness only to the man's thin lips. All around him were quills etching occult symbols into the ever-changing walls, and before him was a modest black desk upon which rested a few old, odd-shaped books. He introduced himself as the archivist of the place and called out to them by name. Although wary of the strange man, our heroes had many questions which he was more than eager to answer. He revealed to them that the events that had transpired in Greenspring, regrettable as they were, represented a mere plan that had been eschewed by the Astrals a long time ago. He revealed to them that they each had a place in the Citadel of Death, but that it was not yet time for them to fill it. He revealed that he himself bore around his neck an amulet made from the final piece of heart that Jen had to retrieve. Furthermore, he offered them various boons in exchange for playing a little role for him in a story that he had created especially for them. Although they knew that they would be subjecting themselves to great danger, our heroes accepted the challenge, etching their names into a strange-looking contraption. The moment they had finished doing so, they started convulsing. Each of them were made to face their darkest fears, the things that they dreaded the most. Shaq was bound in chains in his parents' old home and was forced to wear the weakness he thought to have relinquished long ago, as one by one his family feasted on his flesh and berated his impotence. Grace was faced with the emptiness left in her by her parents' abandonment, being caught in a whirlwind of self-blame and feebleness. She was forced to bear witness to the regret her parents supposedly had for birthing her. Leo bore witness to a world in which everyone he loved was happy and alive, but his family hated him. They all blamed him for not being strong enough, smart enough, good enough to make that reality true, shunning him in the process. Pax was perched atop the world, with his subjects far beneath him on a throne made of gold and blood, in front of him, a mirror where a far older version of himself 
made him choose between his love for his people, his duty to the realm, his ambitions, and his love for grace. A dagger was placed in his hand as blood started to fall from the throne, threatening to drown his subjects. Jen was trapped on a small island, a pool of blood in the center. Her father died next to her, begging her to feed him as he was too weak to feed himself. As soon as she tried to feed him the blood, a much stronger version of her would appear, prohibiting her from doing so. Instead, she herself may feed off the blood and gain its power. Adam was transported to the Astral Sea, where he met a bloated deformed version of his esteemed ancestor, the first Hebdom, who congratulated him for his power whilst preparing to devour him. In the meantime, a multitude of ancestors screamed from inside the bloated abomination his father's voice rang loudest. When all seemed hopeless, the shades of Castile, the ones that they had guided before, came to return the favor. They helped Shaq realize that the binds he had to relinquish weren't the ones holding him, but those etched into his skin, prompting the snake man to bite his own arm off. When Pax chose to end his love instead of sacrificing his principles, they took the dagger he plunged in his own heart to reveal the heart of Finian. They took Leo by the hand when all his loved ones shunned him to remind him that he did his best and even though it wasn't ideal, it was enough. They showed Jen that her father didn't need the power she was battling to pass on to her and that she had the means to feed him all around her, taking her to the edge of the island and lighting the water only to reveal the most luscious cooking instruments below. For Grace, they echoed the words that Pax had been whispering to her, reminding her that even though her past was filled with pain, she had brought joy and was more than enough to one that had everything. Finally, for Adam, they returned the favor and the power he had granted them when the old man was dying, power which he made his own. Thus he was able to cast the shadow of his ancestor to reveal a brighter star pointing the way to the future, his star. After the harrowing experiences ended, the archivist was pleased. He offered them passage, gave up the last piece of Jen's grandmother's heart, and offered Pax one of the books that was laid before him on his desk. He then proceeded to manifest a portal behind him. He took them to the place where the boon that Castiel sought was, but not without warning them that they were heading into the incinerator. With their journey almost at an end, they ventured forth to discover a large room with a small cottage in the middle of it. In the cottage, they encountered the artificer, the man the Durigar expedition was looking for, and, after a few pleasantries, they also discovered that the gem Castiel had sent them to retrieve was etched onto one of his tools. Having been impressed by Pax's mannerisms, he granted them the opportunity to take them Moreover, warning them that they housed powerful beings that he had trapped eons ago. Thus, under the immortal artificer's gaze, they battled the celestial spirits trapped inside, barely avoiding death. Finally, after the long battle, the room began to fill with lava, and against the most animalistic urges one would have, our heroes learned to embrace death such that they may finally live. Oh, wow. This is one hell of an ending. Dying to live? Just... Yeah. Um, until next time, I need a few moments to recover. This was the recap for episode 21 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I am Count Bear, your Vim Recap Narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim The Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 p.m. UTC on youtube.com slash at Dicelvania. 
New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thanks for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.